Um, hi everyone, I'm Shruti uh, from Ashoka um, and uh, very happy to have you all here. Uh, so thank you for joining in. Um, I uh, lead Ashoka's youth program in South Asia where we are building a community of uh, team change makers and institutional partners to help society reimagine a world where every young person can grow practicing to be a change maker. Um, Ashoka, as you may know, is one of the largest networks of social entrepreneurs in the world. Um, for the last 40 years, we have searched, selected and supported some of the most inspiring social entrepreneurs. Um, we have, uh, so far, we have about 4,000 social entrepreneurs um, who have been awarded the Ashoka Fellowship. And we, we continue to look for entrepreneurs who have system changing ideas and are working towards uh, large scale mindset shifts. Um, so today we're very excited to have co-curated the session with the Sankal team um, and to have this very important conversation on building an entrepreneurial ecosystem in South Asia. Uh, we have social entrepreneurs today joining us on this panel from Ashoka Fellow Organizations uh, in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And we will talk about how we can come together to build an ecosystem to encourage and support entrepreneurship in the region uh, towards creating transformative impact, which is what we are all here for. Um, uh, just to give you a little bit uh, of a background on Ashoka Fellows and um, their organizations, uh, Ashoka Fellow organizations, like I said, have been creating systems level change uh, by bringing fundamental mindset shifts that um, explore how to build wider structures that support innovation and entrepreneurial activity. Um, triggering inclusive economic growth um, and in our conversation today we will talk about different ecosystem building measures such as um, developing efficient local social entrepreneurship uh, ecosystems and addressing some of the gaps and challenges of growth for social entrepreneurs, um, innovative funding models, right, that will enable ecosystems and support structures for social enterprises, and how we can prepare for a robust entrepreneurial ecosystem, considering we've all gone through a pandemic now. Um, and also by having our young people at the center of it and developing an entrepreneurial skill set and mindset um, and preparing them for this ecosystem through their growing up years. Um, so on that note, without any further delay, I'll quickly um, introduce our panelists and um, then we'll jump right into our conversation. Um, our first speaker on the panel is Achala. Achala is um, the co-founder and managing director of uh, Good Market um, and has been instrumental in spearheading Sri Lanka's first farm market organic and natural retail shops um, and organic community certification in Sri Lanka. Uh, Achala has won uh, many awards which if I go into the list of we might spend another uh, good part of the afternoon so um, I wouldn't but I encourage you all to look her uh, work up um, really spectacular work. Uh, the next speaker we have um, is Dr. Ananya Rehan. Um, Ananya is the CEO of iSocial. Um, he's a serial entrepreneur um, and has successfully founded DNet and a number of other social uh, enterprises. He's also led the design of products and services which have scaled up for millions in Bangladesh, uh, especially for marginalized communities. And uh, what's interesting is that his uh, approach towards sustainability is a very hybrid model of market-based approach and public goods approach. Um, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll look forward to hearing more on that from him. Um, uh, and last but not the least, we have Sebastian, um, Dr. Sebastian Groh, who's the founder and CEO of um, ME Soul Share through which he's transforming how energy is being delivered. Um, I often read this as the Uber of, uh, um, you know, the, the solar um, energy space. Um, so thank you for joining us, Sebastian. He's, um, he's really developed this game-changing peer-to-peer so solar energy trading platform um, and has received, received numerous awards from the World Economic Forum, Earth Short Prize, and Zayat Sustainability Prize more recently. So thank you all for joining us for this very important conversation. But before we delve deeper into the, um, the ecosystem conversation, it'll be really wonderful to hear from you um, very briefly on your individual entrepreneurial journeys, because um, I think it's, it's really important to, uh, you know, I'm sure there are many learnings and really important to um, hear those. Um, so um, let me start with you, Achala. You started, um, you know, as a farmer's market, right? And now Good Market is a curated community of um, social enterprises, cooperatives, and responsible businesses. So how did you arrive at building this community of um, ethical producers and ethical consumers? 
Uh, thank you, Shruti, for a nice introduction. And uh, uh, before I begin with Good Market Journey, I would like to a little bit explain about my background and what is my motive to, you know, start Good Market. So actually, my uh, I studied economics because I was uh, impressed by microeconomic systems and deeply concerned about economical collapse and challenges. So then after my graduation from University of Colombo, I began work with, you know, local organization in Colombo and learning more about about community organizing, common resource management, social movements, how ideas spread out and how change actually happen, you know. So then eventually this background in economics and social mobilization and environment, it's slowly led me to, you know, start Good Market. So uh, if you're looking for the root cause of, you know, even in Asian community or maybe even Sri Lankan context, you know, most of our, our crisis, especially environmental and social crisis, it's, you know, when we talk about it's hard to avoid economics. We realize that the current economic system is not sustainable. It is, I mean, and also it can be hard to know what to do, but there are some, you know, solutions. So then in 2009 and 2010, I mean, after we ending the Sri Lankan civil war, officially people say it's end. <laughs> uh, many of us around Sri Lanka focused to develop the local economic according to a new story, you know, new rules, which is good for people and planet. So we also started like, you know, as a voluntarily choosing to prioritize people and planet over profit maximization. So the good market idea actually was uh, to make it easier for participation in new economic to find and connect with each other, increase the visibility of the movement and spread up the transition, right? So then we had been talking to friends about like, you know, community-based curation system that would work across economic sectors, scale, organizational type certification, language, and different, you know, dividers. So then, I mean, there would be a minimum standard we thought from the beginning to when we start in good market, we thought, okay, we're going to have a minimum standard to, you know, represent every sector in the economy. And, and then we thought maybe everyone should go to an application and review process and, you know, uh, and meet with good market standards. So that's where we actually thought to start the concept. So then we decided to start a weekly market base because at the at that time we never thought because we never had money, you know, just only discussions. So then we decided to start it maybe small market base. Actually, we started in 2012 as a low cost way to testing out the curation process and the concept. So then, uh, I mean, we, earlier we have, our problem is would people even be interested? You know, we don't know because we know uh, because we had minimum standard for all sectors. I mean, energy to manufacturing to transport, but we figured this would be like a small event, maybe maybe five people, maybe six four people. We are not sure. Maybe sometimes organic farmers will come because we invited them to come because that's the like kind of like a first impression for us. So then. It took a month to find a you know venue even because nobody actually happy to give even the venue when we say like we are going to start a market. People are like ah oh, there's another you know another maybe weekly fair because people won't understand this concept from the beginning. So then uh, for day one day, we only actually started with 32 because that's way better what we expect. So after a few months, we realized realized a lot of people are coming in, even sometimes very interesting groups came and you know connected with us. So today, after 2000, you know, after 10 years, now we are working with more than 2000 groups around the country, you know, they are actually representing uh, social entrepreneurs, they are sometimes maybe responsible businesses, they are change makers, they came with different, you know, ideas, and we started to, you know, work with. So, um, Slowly, when we start Good Market, we realize there are so many people are coming in discussing. But some people said, okay, one, one day per week, we can now come to Colombo and we can meet consumers. We can talk about them. We can talk about how we can be more responsible when it comes to manufacturing. You know, so many good dialogues. So then some, some vendors came and said, shall we start another you know, place for us to like work? maybe uh, as a supermarket it can it, it won't be a supermarket but kind of like an incubator shops that's how we started good market retail chain they are actually what we do we always trying to help these small scale you know communities to to work with like maybe zero waste shop 
and how they can share each other you know and then slowly they can how they can actually ha have a good supply chain to balance you know with all these environmental and social uh, social norms so then that's how we started the food market retail chain and then uh, certification system because when we starting to create ecosystem we realize there are so many gaps you know we started with something small but slowly when we are developing there are so many gaps to address so we we got a lot of volunteers and so many people to help us to you know share their ideas so then with that we started a uh, pgs system participatory guarantee system that is actually low cost i mean a very transparent discussion way to you know to get some organic farmers into the market that's another system and today and also we have a global system called goodmarket.global where we always trying to connect with go global like minded communities and we start dialogue there you know that's how it happened but today you know when you say good market it's very popular within the colombo it's big came like a third place for people to come and spend their time and for entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs this is a place for them to you know do research uh, you know do their job and you know be shine on the platform right so uh, and now we are working with more than 77 countries to share ideas you know um, and sometimes they do businesses each other with you know with all our standards and I, I in a way i can say it's kind of like a social purchasing because they concern about our norms and standards so that's how we started you know in 2012 and today we are actually becoming a quite a bigger tree bigger tree to give the you know shade to so many small people yeah yeah thank you achla i think it's a it's a beautiful example of um, you know starting really small but you know then influencing and changing behaviors to at the systems level you know changing practices right so uh, thank you so much for sharing that uh, more power to you um, if i could move a little bit and you know come to uh, bangladesh now um, uh, and uh, ananya da your journey of starting dnet uh, right initially as a non profit with a core focus on access to information to uh, three new social enterprises over a period of time i social life cord and uh, junction bangladesh um, has been quite an exciting one so if you could just give us perhaps some highlights in, into that journey uh, it will be wonderful you're on mute uh, thank you thank you shruti and uh... Shankar for inviting me to this uh, esteemed panel. Um, I started my career as a teacher in university, and I never thought that I would be an entrepreneur. I wanted to be a political activist and subsequently economist. So I ended up uh, doing PhD in mathematical modeling uh, in Ukraine. and then came back to bangladesh after a short teaching career in um, kiev uh, coming back to bangladesh i entered into the research uh, policy research and then teaching and at that time uh, what i found that what i do i don't see impact of my work directly and decided to uh, get into entrepreneurship and what i saw missing is that connection between the development efforts in bangladesh which have been thriving uh, but uh, the connection to technology is missing largely so my actually uh, idea was to how to connect uh, the uh, technology innovation to development process and and change the livelihoods especially at the bottom of the pyramid and one of those um, endeavors succeed uh, reasonably and you probably know that in bangladesh now more than 5000 union digital center from where the information services the government services are being delivered and that model was tested by dnet and successfully delivered with an entrepreneurship to uh, priest into it i mean two entrepreneurs one man and one woman run together the venture and disseminating information and other services to the community and out of 5000 uh, the udc is now many of them very successful more than half of them are very successful and they deliver not only the government services but also access to finance services to the local entrepreneurs the other actually uh, i would say the derivative of the core model was uh, info lady so when we saw that in the digital centers women are not coming and we thought that to reach out to them and we identified that whether the village women who are educated 
can go door to door and deliver uh, services or connecting with the specialists. So initially it was through mobile phone and then through uh, digital technology. And that model evolved and iSocial is kind of a offspring of DNET, uh, one, of the, as a, one of the flagship programs. And then we uh, also launched uh, Life, Life Card, which is about uh, delivery of the maternal health service through digital technology. And we have served more than 2.2 million young mothers and their families in how to take care of the pregnant women during pregnancy and after uh, pregnancy. So if I summarize the journey and key lessons learned, I mean, in short, First, I see that the dilemma of the impact mindset and the profit mindset <laughs> and it's very difficult to connect and not uh, it's not uh, straightforward. And I think that is one of the challenges of social entrepreneurship. Uh, we need to, uh, I mean, research more. I mean, understanding the psyche of an entrepreneur and social entrepreneur. So that is one key highlights. The second is the... Uh, importance of skills. You see that when you do some creative job, straightforward skills you acquire from the university or uh, schools, it's not easy to apply directly. So you need to improvise, you need to be creative. And connection of creativity with these skills is also, I think, one of the challenges when you do some innovation. innovation. And uh, oftentimes we ignore the process. Uh, we are so excited with the ideas and we is the business case of it. So business case is also important because resource is limited no matter from how it is coming. And you need to utilize in a way that you can continue your journey or you create some knowledge which can be taken by someone and take it forward. Not necessarily you have to do everything. So I think these are the key probably highlights of my journey as an entrepreneur. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think there are some really uh, interesting um, discussion points that you've you've triggered there. Uh, you know, from your learnings and uh, another uh, another um, aspect from you know one learning from your journey that I have witnessed is also the uh, the many. Um, entrepreneurs that um, you know you have sort of built in your journey as well right at the local level I think that triggering that um, that has been very powerful um, uh, in the work that you do um, Ananyata so thank you Sebastian uh, coming over to you um, right like I was saying that you know your world's first peer-to-peer -peer, uh, solar energy sharing platform how have you evolved as a social entrepreneur since you started your journey and what were the uh, what were some of the key levers that in enabled you to create impact, not just at an individual personal level, but also perhaps at the uh, at the ecosystem level? Sure, sure. Um, so I think it's an it's an interesting point right now in juncture in the whole energy world. So I'll, I'll, apologies in advance, I will talk a lot about energy right now. Um, so when we started, we set up this peer to peer grid, as you said, and uh, that's quite a that's quite a big word. Um, so let me just, sorry, I, 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 I um, what it basically means is just we enabled sharing of energy. Um, we saw a lot of houses with solar home systems, and then we also saw people who don't have electricity. So while houses had systems, their batteries at times were full, and the neighboring house wouldn't have anything. So it's a very intuitive thing that you try to share that electricity. So this peer-to-peer -peer grid was nothing else than it was if Uber, since you, you brought that up, would claim to have invented ride sharing. That's obviously nonsense. And same thing is, is, is for us. It just happened to be the first grid we installed. And we didn't even know that it's a peer-to-peer -peer grid. We were made aware of that much later. Um, we came in with the notion that being able to sell electricity and making money is a fantastic idea. Unfortunately, the people didn't think that like that. <laughs> the people priority first and foremost was to get reliable electricity. And I think that teaches us a lesson for today also. It was not so much about the cost per unit. It was all about to be able to access it whenever they want. So what we found is when we give them this box, which would allow them to sell electricity, they said, that's all fine, but I'm actually only interested to buy. 
Now, we knew that their batteries are full at times and not selling would be wasting. But that argument didn't go through. There was in almost every case, a certain period where they said, no, I only want to sell. So we installed in the box a button where they could override our efficient algorithm, what we believe is efficient, which would mean a moment a battery starts, hits 100%, you would start selling. And they would, no, I, I press the button, only buy. And over a couple of months of getting to know the system, this would slowly change. And as often the trigger of this change may be that someone goes to her neighbor and sees, oh, she has quite a bit of money on her soul box, which is our media, which shows money. Why don't I have that much money? And then we get a call and we say, hey, actually, you know, I'm richer than her. Why does she have more money on her box? Because she's selling. Huh, why don't I sell? You said you don't want to sell. <laughs> so that's, that's how you, you know, you trigger this and, and, and you get... Uh, onto that journey. On the lessons learned is first, obviously, I mean, I think that that was the main message of that, uh, of that little story here. What you think is a good model or a good idea is not necessarily what your customers think is a good idea or a good model. So I think that became very clear and you need to listen and you need to, you know, remain, overwrite your own code, which you think is so nice and say, no, it's full, but they don't want to sell. Like in economics, we would say, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because any additional unit you would sell, you could send it for one taka, it would make sense because otherwise it gets wasted. But um, as we have learned in economics, and I think probably Anonya knows that much better, uh, this homo economicus doesn't exist and it's not always rational, rational thinking. Um, another thing was, I was strongly convinced that I can do everything bottom up without the government. So I, I try to stay as far away from it as possible. And I said, look, I'm in the off-grid area, which is unregulated. I do this bottom up and my model works. And then I will do millions like Ononia did. Unfortunately, I didn't. What was the problem? The problem is that bottom up does not always work. Neither does top down, obviously. And you cannot ignore the government because the government can then do things you would never predict. And that can get you into trouble. In our case, it was actually a, a very good thing because the government took matters in its own hands and extended the grid much faster than anybody would have projected. It was a very similar situation in India. Since this is being done with a very high degree of subsidies, that suddenly undermined or submerged our model, where the people are trading with each other at a rate which is more in line with you know, what the market would command, given that they have a PV and a storage. So that, that was a very sobering experience. And then again, you have, to, you have to pivot, you have to change things. And so forth. So we started selling to the national grid. So the people, it's actually quite a cool thing. Um, people who were initially left out, as in not connected, are now connected to the grid and are co-powering it, which I think is, is, is quite an astonishing thing. Uh, we're working a lot of, of EVs, but I think that's beside the point. I would much rather like to continue the discussion and, and maybe, and that's a hypothesis, is the difference between Ononia reaching millions and Solskjaer not yet, maybe is this better integration of government activities and working more in line and hand in hand uh, from a social enterprise perspective. Just a, just a thought. Yeah. No, no, that's, uh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Sebastian. I think there are some very... Um, you know, important learnings there uh, for us as an ecosystem as well, right? You know, how do you sort of take all stakeholders together? Um, how do you, um, how do you, um, uh, you know, uh, focus not just on the community, but also on the other players in the ecosystem? So thank you for sharing that. And, and, and just on that note, I think it's a very important segue right now from individual um, journeys and, and the learnings from there to, um, the larger ecosystem conversation, right? And and we often hear uh, South Asia to be considered as emerging hub of social entrepreneurship by many, but we do also see a lot of focus on um, the startup and the business ecosystem um, of it, right? And perhaps not as much as the social enterprise side of it. And of course, we have platforms like Sankalp where we have spaces for these conversations, uh, but there still seems to be 
um, you know, uh, many gaps and a lack of uh, perhaps infrastructure services and even more local networks that can provide support to social enterprise enterprises. Um, so I do want to focus on some of these challenges and gaps that you may have identified in your work in the region. And uh, perhaps that will also give us an insight into what more can be done to building the uh, social enterprise ecosystem. So uh, maybe Sebastian, we can start, uh, we can continue on, 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 on the piece that you were speaking about, right? And, uh, are there any major gaps that you um, identify for social enter enterprises in Bangladesh currently? And um, how has it influenced your work as a social entrepreneur in, in generating impact? And you did touch upon a few of them, uh, but yeah. I'd to sort of dig deeper. Yeah. Happy to elaborate and happy to throw in a, maybe a little bit of provocative statements. And, and because I know I'm being followed by Ananya who has much more experience, so he can, he can rectify that. Said. So first of all, to start with, there is no such thing as a social enterprise in Bangladesh. Yeah, I, I, if I go to the registration office, I can register as an NGO or as a limited company. That's it. So how do I identify as a social enterprise, except for I write it on my website and I, you know, I uh, baptize myself as such, um, which is a challenge because sometimes, you know, to people ask us, are you a uh, they usually would ask, are you a for-profit or not-for-profit, which I translate into, are you an NGO? Are you a, a, a limited company? Um, in, in, we have, we have um, an entity in Singapore where there is a social enterprise um, network which can give you a certificate that you're a social enterprise, and then you get, I mean, it becomes a little bit more formal, but also not yet in, form, in, in, in front of the law, but for instance, if you open a bank account or something like that. So that, that to start with, which is... Which is kind of counterintuitive given that Bangladesh is kind of the, the hotbed or the birth of lots of social business, like the, the whole Grameen uh, uh, setup as well as social enterprise, the whole BRAC setup, um, that you wouldn't have a legal form for that. And, and that puts you, that has a lot of consequences. The first time we won something like a, a prize money or a grant, there is no way you can get this into the country. It is, it's not possible. And whoever tells me that it is, I say, yeah, but I'm not breaking the law. So you, you, if you're not an NGO, you can't do it because you have to then do tricks like make it look like a service agreement. Then I suddenly have to pay advance income tax, which is kind of the, the most stupidest idea ever for a startup to pay that because you don't have profits. So why, why I bank $100,000 on my advance income tax credits, which I will get when I don't need it anymore, right? So... It, it, it has a lot of consequences. So we routed it then through Singapore. And so to get the money in, in uh, from, a, from basically a, a holding company to, um, uh, to a daughter's, it was the only legal way I found out of that. So um, these are very simple things, mm -hmm. but they can literally kill you in the beginning. Because that can mean that you thought you won $100,000, but you're only getting into your hands after nine months. What do you do in these nine months? You are, you, are, you are strapped for money. So this has very, very serious implications, especially when you start out. And I think this is, this is a problem. And I think this is not a problem which is talked enough about because there's right now quite a hype on startups, which led to what? That some organizations declare every startup in Bangladesh a social impact startup now because by definition, Bangladesh has, a, and, and they actually said that, by definition, Bangladesh has so many social problems. So whatever business you do here is a social impact startup. <laughs> and that again that 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 makes it very messy um because then the 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 um if you identify as a social impact startup but then the next travel agency is also a social impact startup it becomes complicated right because then you are competing for resources and it's not you the discussion is kind of you know a very different one I mean, and i i i'm really looking forward to what what Ononia has to say on that, uh, because that's what I observe here. And um, it makes things messy. Um, things are getting better. We have a few activities now where um, there are dedicated resources going towards it. But since there is no consensus, not in Bangladesh, but in the world, mm. what you know, social impact is, or at least not what it is, but how to measure it, uh, there are different ways. There's a social return on investment and whatnot, but there's no consensus. That makes it always complicated for an investor to measure 
anything beyond, okay, this is your financial impact. I can calculate this return on investment. I know that, but how do I measure the rest? So environmental has come down to tons of CO2 avoided. Yeah, fantastic. There's no notion of when this is being avoided. There's no notion of how this is being avoided. And that, for instance, puts adaptation in a very, in a very uh, small corner. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll pause here. Lots of, lots of issues around that. Right, right. No, uh, thank you for sharing some of those. And another, I, I had a question for you, but I'm going to, since Sebastian has already invited you to, to respond to that, I would, I would love to hear from you. Yeah, I probably add a few things uh, which are in disadvantage to the social enterprise, be it for profit or not for profit. Just on taxation, any private company gives tax on the, uh, I mean, um, profit. But for the social enterprise, especially for non-profit, uh, you have to pay tax on the revenue. That means that whether you are making surplus or not, profit or not, you have to pay tax on your revenue. So that's a huge disadvantage. Uh, basically, you know, it became very prominent when the NGOs started also doing commercial activities for sustainability because donor funding has been dying up, drying up. So they started to find alternatives and they found that it's very difficult because taxation keeps. The second thing is that you, uh, if you are a nonprofit, you can take grant, but you cannot take equity investment. And if you are a for-profit social enterprise, you can take equity investment, but not grant. Uh, so we brought the, uh, I mean, example of UK, the Community Interest Company Act, which allows taking both grants and investment. And we have been trying to promote this concept, but we are still not successful. So I think as you're talking about ecosystem in South Asia, I think we should bring also, I mean, evidences from South Asia so that we can influence our policy making process and learn from each other. I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for sharing that because, uh, you know, these are things that only um, social entrepreneurs like you who are running enterprise and have these everyday challenges to deal with can, you know, bring uh, into the conversation. And Atula, I know that, you know, we we spoke about this um you know, uh, 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 when when we had a conversation as well, that some of the, these are also some of the challenges that you face in Sri Lanka. So uh, I would like to invite you to uh, respond. But I would also uh, I also wanted to request you to perhaps um, comment on um, you know the your experience of building the local uh, entrepreneurship com entrepreneurial communities right at at the rural level because i feel like you know there are some powerful learnings there which which you can bring in from your good market experience as well yeah so ananya i think uh, most of the cases like when sebastian and uh, uh, ananya explained a bit similar you know even in sri lankan policy level and then you know when you go to the register your business it can be like a social you know ngo it can be a, like a business but they have only two way you can go under maybe business if not you have to go to the ngo so we are trying to work through in within this spectrum right because we always think like somewhere maybe someone is closer to that ngo side they can go with that but people like us we are trying to earn and reinvest so then, you know, we are trying to be with it. But, you know, again, you know, explaining to the government people, policymakers to explain who we are and how we are trying to do, do things, how we can measure our impact, you know, uh, explaining this is very challenging still in Sri Lanka. But the only thing actually our network in within the Sri Lanka, like, you know, we have a quite a strong young uh, network of social entrepreneurs that is quite strong. Uh, we are trying to becoming a like pressure group to the government now because of that, you know, most of political people when they're writing their manifestos, they write about, you know, social enterprise and entrepreneurship and going to give the recognition and all, but still in the debate. But, you know, when you when I really talk about challenges, even these days, we are trying, we are going through a huge challenges. I'm, I'm sure you all heard about Sri Lanka economical collapse, you know, every day, even now I have a power cut, you know, <laughs> trying to, you know, I'm actually spending few few hours to queue on to get, you know, for that's a way, you know, we really need solutions, we try to do. But when you when we really talk about like when we start Good Market in 2012, you know, 
I know we want to develop a social entrepreneurial ecosystem, but our problem is we never had a good entrepreneurial ecosystem even in the country. Everything, all our products came from outside. And we depend on the imports, even small things where we can make here, everything came from outside. So with that, you know, start getting rural people and slowly develop them to a, you know, proper market and measuring profit, social and environmental impact such a big challenge because you know nobody's understanding when we when we encourage even the communities to talk think about like hey there are so many things available in your area why do you want to take an opportunity from this and be uh, make a group and come up with a solution and we can find a market for you when you're trying to even explain this you know they don't understand so we had a huge problem to developing entrepreneurial ecosystem plus adding it to social entrepreneurial ecosystem, you know, that both challenge we came across. Um, and we, even you touched that, you know, when we are working with local communities, how we did it, you know. So luckily, we had a quite a good, because we had a lot of funding, you know, because of Sri Lankan civil war and the tsunami, we got so many funding around the country with that, these social entrepreneurial ideas is spread, you know, and then they can have given some machineries to communities and develop some of, you know, product and then the, you know, nice interesting conversation that was there. That's actually quite a start, easy for us to, you know, start. So then, um, but, but, you know, you know, you know, even in Sri Lankan context, people are always trying to go with profit, you know, if they're not getting money, they were not happy to do things because of the, you know, getting free money from donor fundings, they always believe that. So then we had put extra energy to explain them, hey, there is no money with us, we have only the like, you know, knowledge, a platform for you to share, and you have to sign up and work with us. So then we that actually we went to the communities, we went to across the country, we done, have done a lot of research and we collected like-minded people, people who really wanted to come and do the change, you know. That's how we started with the people and and then when we are connecting them to them to correct market, you know, we came to Colombo to start a market. We never thought to go back to the village and start a market. We started in Colombo, we connected these small people to the conscious consumers, people who are looking these kind of products, people are thinking about giving back to the nature, giving back to the society, giving back to the marginalized communities, right? So with that, that combination actually really worked. So then they started a dialogue and then even some customers are happy to pay maybe another one or two rupee for communities because they, they know these products, this money is go back to the community and they know where my food come from. They know who made my cloth, right? That, that the discussion actually really started and now it's really going very well that's why actually we were started even though without any donor funds we were going we are earning we're investing that's a kind of like a secret because we kind of got the correct people in 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 same discussion and then the attitudes you know we were we had so many problems with social attitudes and explaining them you know uh, it's really hard for some people to like say like no this is what we expect when we talk about how you can ma minimize energy when you talk about using daylight when you talk about minimizing transportation you know when we are start introducing these standards always depends always challenges for people to you know explain and in the same time as sebastian said the impact monitoring you know now after some businesses rural communities when they develop their business after the startup level maybe in the middle level they are always trying to find you know good investor would maybe bank so they would keep you know when we are trying to explain to maybe investor about like you know impact like social impact and environmental impact they are always ended up with the finance report because they have some kind of like a framework. But for the social and environmental impact, it's really, you know, very hard for us to measure. Uh, with that, actually, we're really, you know, facing challenges like people to like, you know, day-to-day -day practices, how we have to do it, what type of things we have, we won't ask from them to practice, what type of things that we won't ask them to adapt, you know, this kind of like a problems always, we still we are facing, you know, we are trying to actually develop things. That's why we develop like, curation process, application process for people to like fill application, get knowledge and slowly adapt and come back, you know. That's why we started that, you know, step-by-step uh, -step process for, for them to like, you know, grow up. And also like information flow, because most of our knowledge is based in Colombo City. These are not going back to the village because we are, we are trying to work with a lot of rural village, but still 2000. But there are so many other people are waiting to connect. So then we also don't have much resources and then we are trying to actually share the knowledge, 
but you know we are like small organization there are there are there are a lot to wait every day we are getting so many phone calls but it's really hard to you know cater because information flow is not really going but we are trying to use with social media to you know get things uh, uh, yeah organize and give support thank you thank you achala i think uh, i think uh, one of the most one of the, one of the powerful sort of um, insights that i hear from you know what you just shared is is how how local um, entrepreneurial system sort of fed back into the the larger ecosystem level changes right at at not just um, uh the behavior level but also shifts in terms of you know mindset so um i think that's um, that's very powerful to see and i'm sure it's uh it's sounding very easy right now but i'm sure there's a lot of work that has gone in from you and your team into that so um uh, thank you for sharing that um uh, and and uh, and you also touched upon the role of funders and investors right and i think i think it's very important that uh, you know we we speak about them uh because they are one of the key forces of strengthening the ecosystem right and um there is this conversation about new financing models that can change the social impact sector uh we often hear about uh, patient capital um so uh, ananya the uh, what has your experience been how can funders be sustainably engaged uh not just to meet the needs of social entrepreneurs or um to subscribe uh to um you know a, a, an outreach number but to go beyond that right and to bring a systemic shift in in building a larger uh, entrepreneurial culture and of course uh, you know it's easier said than done but you know we have to start that work at some point so how how has your experience been in interacting with uh with funders on that uh, i think uh, all kind of funders are interested to invest in uh social impact uh, kind of initiative it's uh, it's about how you connect their interest uh interest is not always that they need to make money but also interest to uh, look them good or uh, in terms of there are some initiatives of global impact that uh, they need to contribute to the society or giving back something like that so i think it it has been evolving for a while in bangladesh um, for example now many uh, development partners are supporting not only non profit but also for profit social enterprises uh, through a market development mechanism so trying to uh, build up kind of market based system where only uh development based approach is not sustainable i mean uh, it's mostly project based so when project ends all the benefits uh, actually gone so that connection i think important and as a natural uh, subsequent i mean consequence of that is uh, the model of blended uh, financing or um, i mean connecting the funding from the development partners with the private equity funding or funding from the private sector so that is actually is becoming more visible now and i think uh, it's very powerful instrument uh, for the social enterprise uh, down the line other than that also it is recognized that participation of women in entrepreneurship ecosystem is very important and uh, for bangladesh's case for example uh, 80% versus 36 36% in terms of uh, women's participation in uh, economic activity so there's a huge gap and for to minimizing that gap you need to invest in women women entrepreneurship okay. not only for the um, entrepreneurs who are already in the ecosystem those potential women who can come to the entrepreneurship ecosystem and both in rural and urban areas so that focus actually is now getting kind of a, uh, shape through concept of gli gender lens investing so i think uh, both uh, blended financing and gli need to craft in a way that uh, it can bridge the gap or uh, the uh, i mean uh, island like uh, activities of two kind of sources of funding so i think uh, the social entrepreneur ecosystem players need to be very active to uh, i mean drive these two sources of interest in a way that it really goes to the right direction and supports those entrepreneurs who are not actually trying to sell their business after showing huge traction following the silicon valley model i don't think that silicon valley model is appropriate for countries like south asia so we have to have our own model where this kind of financing model would play a big role 
rather than only venture capital funding. I'm yeah. not sure what Sebastian or Achala thinks about that. Would you have any comments, Sebastian, on that? From well, I mean, you, usually we, we refer to it as that opportunity driven or mission driven, right? So I think what Ananya is, is referring to is this opportunity driven model where you basically see an opening and you try to put everything in it and with the with the very conscious goal to exit as quick as possible so you can you know this famous retire at 30 and the the challenge always is it's it's usually not that easy and then when obstacles come you basically give up because you are opportunity driven and so when the opportunity closes you you give up whereas if you're mission driven i think what ononia refers to is uh, you go the extra mile or the extra marathon <laughs> to, to be precise so that would be my my, my quick take and i'm I'm sure that, I mean, obviously for South Asia, I would agree, we need a lot more uh, opportunity, not sorry, a lot more mission-driven uh, mm. founders. That is very clear. Um, but yeah, let me, let me stop there. Let me stop there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I, I think um, along with funders, there is another, uh, you know, if you talk about the larger entrepreneurial culture, um, Right, I think there's one important factor that uh, that I know, Sebastian, you are doing some work on, um, it, which is the role of um, education. Right, a role, the role of uh, the larger. Uh, uh, the social entrepreneurship education programs or even instituting change making in our education system early on right so that we have we are building the entrepreneurial skill set and mindset for our young people much early so that you know this robust ecosystem that we are talking about building uh, we have uh, talent coming in who are capable of uh, running with it right so um, how can uh, what role do you think the uh, social entrepreneurship education programs or uh, even you know instituting change making early on have on the larger ecosystem level shift that we are talking about and how do you envision that uh, playing on for uh, South Asia? Yeah, let me actually try to bridge that from, from what I said before. Like last week was the climate week in New York and I was on this panel and I was very lucky because Bill Gates also came on the panel and I was asked, you know, what is, what would be my request to him? And if you think about it, um, the things he funds right now in energy, this breakthrough energy ventures is very big inventions, which have a small chance of working, but then would possibly have a big, big impact, like this big swing thinking, a new way of, uh, of nuclear fusion or fission even, uh, and so forth. And I said, look, first of all, we're on a clock. 2027, we will have, uh, uh, we will have damage, which will be irreversible. That's five years. So any of those solutions, need 10, 20 years to become commercial. Uh, secondly, the fight for climate change will be decided in emerging markets. I think it's very clear by now. Now the question is, do we do it with through this big thing? And I think what, what Achala was saying is this good market. If you think about how Bill Gates made his money, he so it's not a big invention. Basically it was, how can I empower billions of people through windows, through an interface that they can create value? For me, that's, that's Microsoft. Why not adopt that thinking? How can I empower, maybe not billions, but hundreds of millions of social innovators, social entrepreneurs to make their solution ubiquitous? I think that's probably a little bit what, what good market is, 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 is trying to achieve, right? So, and if he has done this with software, would not his time and investment, his money be best placed a bet to mimic this kind of making it ubiquitous in the world in the climate space through this? So that was a little bit the, 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 the challenge I tried to put out there. And just to, to weave that into your question on the education, um, as part of uh, Brack University, I teach a course which is called the Social Entrepreneurship Practicum. And I co-teach that with, I think we are 10 right now, 10 professors from all around the world. Uh, this is a fantastic batch. It's, it's led by, by a guy named, by the name of Alejandro Crawford. And he invented this rebel base, which is a platform where we take those social entrepreneurs through um, what we call modules, stage by stage by stage, but always interacting with each other. So we have 10 professors, means we also have 10 batches. We have students from 
Palestine, from the US, from Colombia, from China, uh, and so forth. And from Bangladesh, obviously, the Bangladesh batch. And the exciting thing is, first of all, students figure out that their problems and challenges they have are not unique. A problem students encompass in Dhaka, to their really big surprise, also students encompass in New York City. And that's really a really cool insight for them. And then they start to form teams, not only this is the BRAC team, but suddenly you have international teams and you work on social issues. You walk through this rebel-based platform and um, that really puts you to the test because you, you kind of, you rebel-base it. Rebel-base it for us means you really put your ideas to the test and you get it to a stage where you can, where you can pitch it. Now, if we can create an army of those social innovators, whether it's through Rebel Base or whatever program or through Bill Gates, you know, changing his mind. I think that could be so powerful because the countries who have the biggest challenges and problems like Sri Lanka, like Bangladesh, when it comes to climate change, obviously they have a, they, you know, they have an idea or two how to solve them because they're confronted with it all the time. So leveraging these solutions and making them ubiquitous or scale them which work today, I think that would be really, really powerful. And I think their education can play a big role, be it through this Open Society University Network program we, we teach at Brack University or any other education program, like Good Market, what I, I, it really resonated with me because that is this, can I give the tools and power? And if I have millions of social entrepreneurs who work on climate change, I think we have a bigger impact than we do one of these big, big swing thinking investments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's very important. Thank you for sharing that, Sebastian. I will pause with my questions right now because perhaps I could go on for a few more hours asking these questions and I'll take some questions from the audience that are coming in. Um, one of the comments that we have here is that, uh, you know, uh, from what Achala was uh, sharing earlier, how it's important to build uh, the community level consciousness before um, starting uh, the conversation on uh, shifting the entrepreneurial level ecosystem changes, right? Um, uh, particularly around social businesses. So um, there is a, a clear, um, you know, need for understanding what social businesses are. Um, you know, both Ananya and Sebastian also touched on that. Uh, and policy level shifts are required. So, um, you know, if we had to really talk about um, you know, in your respective countries, what are some of those, you know, urgent policy shifts that we should be looking at? Um, is there is there something that, you know, comes on comes on to your mind? It'll really be good to hear for the audience. And any other, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. In the um, Bangladesh context, yeah. I fully agree with the comment of the uh, participant that, the community needs to be ready mentally first, and only then they can accept changes or new things. And so when you work with the entrepreneurs, it's not in isolation that you work with one person. You need to work with the community that entrepreneur works with. So that approach, I think, would be a powerful shift in the uh, ecosystem level activities, I would say. Uh, and it's important because for countries like us, uh, densely populated employment generation is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And what we find that skills are lacking for even, uh, I mean, job, jobs are there, but, um, but the skills are not adequate to get those jobs. So on the one hand, employment needs to be addressed. On the other hand, that, uh, that is not possible by big investment, as Sebastian mentioned, that the uh, a big investment in energy sector cannot create many jobs. That's huge investment, but we call it jobless growth kind of investment. But we need investment where you can also create jobs. So from that perspective, because if you do not, um, I mean, invest in creating jobs, then you are actually creating a social bomb to be blasted and create yeah. uh, chaos. Um, so from that perspective, I think. Now, entrepreneurship should be uh, a, a very important, I mean, policy priorities, and uh, not only for the uh, social entrepreneurship, any, any kind of entrepreneurship, I think, important. And it's not possible to, uh, I mean, instill entrepreneurship mindset overnight. So it should be started from the very early stage, and not only in urban good schools, 
but across the country, actually, we need to do that so that nobody is left behind in terms of uh, opportunities to participate in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you, thank you. I think that's um, that's very important, and I'm and I'm so glad that uh, you know our participants sort of brought that up um, because uh, you know it's it's a demand versus supply conversation, right? That we we often forget to have, uh, especially when we are talking about policy level shifts. Um, there's another comment on uh, you know just uh, just moving from the larger ecosystem to more of the challenges that you as social entrepreneurs face. Uh, uh, in building trust with um, with your customers, right? So, um, how um, uh, how has that experience been, um, Achala? Would you would you like to share? Of course, Shruti, because you know, like, because anyway, we are trying to build a, uh, I mean, entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? So, without a consumer, how we can we can't talk, right? Because it's not sustainable then. So then, uh, because when we talk about like, you know, uh, rural products, eco friendly, and then natural and giving back to the community, maybe fair trade, all, all these expect things are always go with some kind of like a conscious consumers, right? If we wanted to get conscious consumer mean, they're very detail oriented, they want to know where this come from, who made this, this money goes back to, to whom, you know, these information is really much needed so that's why when we started good market you know we we started the curation process going through application process when they meet good market standard they can come to the platform they and and there they have the small profile right they claim every single point they claim they say it's like Okay, I, I I minimize my water. I minimize my energy. Um, I I only I, I never use agrochemicals, right? That's how they claim. So these conscious consumers are going through every single information, right? If they have a doubt, they quickly come and flag. They keep questioning. They do trips to go to the field and go and see, you know. Every day, sometimes when I go to market, some customers, before I go to market, if, if this vendor is new vendor, they keep asking. And if they have any problem, as example, maybe accidentally they bought uh, maybe plastic packaging, they quickly came to me and said, hey, Ajwa, there's a problem. Why this, this vendor is bringing polythene to the market? You know, right. That's the like conscious level of the consumer. So they definitely, trans I mean, the information, I mean, the transparency is really, really must to develop an ecosystem and also not in the not the developing to maintaining it because we have done more than 10 years now we are remaining and keep growing with the communities now we are working with more than 2500 to 6000 like that's a range of con con consumers we work with yeah. they keep asking yeah. and then at the same time we develop a like kind of like a you know team like con a consumer team we have annual general meetings we invited vendor and then the farmer or maybe producer and the consumer to have a dialogue so, you know they talk they debate they adjust they you know change their levels and the rules you know that's how it happens so definitely that should happen otherwise you know you can't do that from yeah. there only then you can spread your word you know it's kind of like a pyramid you know even in sri lanka everything goes like trends you know when we say like uh, by also by local some people like oh not really local you know that's a kind of like a mentality but we started with conscious people they are the one who make kind of like a trends in the country from there now people are copying you know then the, then the majority is now copying they talk about you know like giving back to the country and the nature and the people you know so now in, because now sri lanka is going through a huge economical crisis now we are experiencing mm -hmm. these problems you know now government and the people are realizing the importance of you know locally based and in the you know um, and then they're being conscious about environment and people so now it's becoming like a good for us because now i feel this crisis has happened to happen for good good because people now actually very conscious and even the majority is coming back to us and you know maybe even they're happy to pay another five rupee to the giving back to the community because they are not now they're not too sure about imports you know they're not too sure about who's going mm -hmm. to get things you know and then the financial problems and then the dollars and everything is you know mm -hmm. like a little bit of messy here so that's how i mean the, you know we have developed the conscious consumers and we are having you know even our social media is very very powerful and very popular every day we are getting thousands of messages and questions we keep us answering keep we keep sharing our information now everything on 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 outside on platform everybody can see transparency is number one actually you know within the within the community yeah thank you thank you Achala. um 
uh, I think, uh, you know, like a trust building, like in any relationship, right, is, is such a process and it's a time consuming process, right? And, and um, you know, I, I, I know from the patterns that we see with our work with social entrepreneurs uh, at Ashoka, you know, it takes a lot of work to build trust with not just your customers, but also with your producers, with the entire value chain. So thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, I'm afraid there are more questions, but we don't we don't have enough time. Uh, so um, I would just, uh, you know, uh, request all the participants to perhaps reach out to you directly on your uh, LinkedIn uh, and, uh, and, you know, ask these questions, these very relevant questions. And I, I just want to... Um, uh, thank you, all of you, all, all our speakers for the spectacular conversations, for all our participants for having uh, joined in. Um, and thank you to the Sankalp team, as always, for designing these spaces, right, for having such important cross-border uh, conversations. Uh, I hope we come back next year, having made some progress by, you know, doing our bits in building the ecosystem um, and to share more of our successes and perhaps failures as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you. I think this has been just wonderful. Thank you so much for um, joining in um, and I, I hope we continue this conversation um, through the year with all the work that we do. If there are any final words, I would leave that open. Otherwise, um, we, could, we could close. No, Thank thanks, for, thanks for having us, Shruti. Thank you. That's Thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank, thank you.